Okay, Elizabeth, I just transfer it to you. Okay, and um, wanted to know how the size of my sketch is. You should see a sketch that has the key curriculum up in the left corner and the title of the presentation. Uh, how's it looking on your screen? It looks good on mine. Okay, great. All right, so um, I want to just take a second to, to talk about our new website. Andres mentioned it. Um, we've done a little name change going by key curriculum now because um, we're more focused on software and less focused on books um, and a uh, new organization of the website. We hope you like it um, and you'll notice we have a new logo and so the, the first part of my presentation is actually going to be on that logo because it was um, built in Sketchpad originally and we liked it so much that we made it our, our company logo. Um, so if you type in the old uh, website, keypress.com, it will automatically route you over to our new website. So if you can't spell curriculum, that's okay. Keypress will still, will still work to get you to our new site. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through uh, what I'm going to be doing today in this presentation. First thing is um, introduction. Uh, Andres has already done that, but I'm Elizabeth C. Carley, and um, our MC is Andres Marty, and we have both been at Key Curriculum for seven and a half years. And uh, I'm going to do a poll in a second so I can find out a little bit about you. Um, I'm going to be looking at the logo and taking two approaches. One is just a real basic approach to building the sketch, and the second one will be a more polished presentation sketch. Um, and then I'm going to take a look at transformations of functions and kind of do the same thing, real basic version, and then seeing ways that you can polish a sketch and make it more optimized for um, interactive whiteboards, for example. And then if we have time, um, I'll show you just a couple of fun things that can can add a little bit of, of pizzazz to your presentations. Okay, so um, I think the first thing I wanted to do was uh, ask a couple of poll questions. So when the poll questions come up, please go ahead and answer. I'm launching one now. Um, Okay, so you should see a poll on your screen. Okay, I always like to try to get up towards the 90% voting, so vote. Uh, okay, almost. Okay, one more second and then I will close the poll. Okay, so 85%. Uh, some people don't want to commit there, oh, so that's fine. Okay, so um, poll shows us we have about almost 80% of you with Sketchpad 5, um, a few with 4 and 3, and a uh, few of you don't have Sketchpad yet. That's fine. I don't want you to be scared off by the intermediate label of this presentation. It may be, um, it will give you a small sliver of what you can do in Sketchpad, but I'm actually going to be building everything from scratch, so it's um, not, a bad, not a bad introduction to just a very small <laughs> part of the features of Sketchpad. Um, okay, I'm gonna, so yeah, a lot of Sketchpad 5 users, and I will be using the features of Sketchpad 5 today. Um, second question is about access to an interactive whiteboard, so if you have access to an interactive whiteboard for your, um, for your teaching, uh, please answer. Okay, interesting. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and show you the results. Okay, so um, almost 60% do have access, and, and then some of you said, nope, but soon, and 35% don't. Okay, so um, some of the suggestions I'm going to give for um, interactive whiteboard optimization will also apply to just regular old projectors, um, so uh, hopefully those will be useful to a lot of you. And last poll is about iPad access. And on this one, you can choose all of the answers that apply. You might have uh, your own iPad and an iPad for use at school. Um, so just curious about this. Okay. Um, all 
Committee and getting up close to 90% voting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this one and share it. Okay, so uh, this is good for me to know for the presentation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, talking about sketches for the iPad, but I'm going to point you to resources that can help you. So if you are um, in this group, you have an iPad that you can use at home, or you have an iPad that you can use at school, or in particular for those of you lucky enough to have iPads for use at school, I'll point you to some great resources and, and give you some tips. Our, um, our iPad app is free in the App Store, so but it's um, because it's a viewer, you have to think a little bit differently when you're designing sketches for use on the iPad. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but not spend a lot of time on it. All right, so I want to go ahead and get started. Thanks for sharing that with me. Helps me out. Okay. Um, yes, and uh, so that, um, Karen Greenhouse in the chat panel, that's actually Andres, and so don't be tripped up by that. Uh, there's not a third person in the background. Karen couldn't make it tonight. Um, but please do ask questions and chat in the chat panel. I try to look over at, at the chat panel, but sometimes they get too involved in what I'm doing, and then Andres can interrupt me and say, hey, we have some questions or comments, or, and, and that's why uh, we like to have uh, two people on these webinars. Okay, so uh, first thing we're going to do is build the logo from scratch, and I'm going to do the um, kind of the easiest, most basic construction to start, and then we're going to fancy it up. Um, okay, so the logo is built on a circle, and I'm going to make a pretty big circle there, and I'm going to just hide, this point controls the size of my circle, and while I'm constructing the logo, I don't want the size of my circle to change, so I'm going to go ahead and hide that, and I'm going to construct a radius using the segment tool. And because I've constructed the endpoint on the circle, if I rotate, that will rotate around the circle. And then I'm going to go ahead and construct a point on the radius. And that point will only slide along the radius. That is the, the path of that point. Now I'm going to make some um, color changes to make it clear which points are which. So I'm going to make this guy purple. Uh, the one on the circumference, I'm going to make it, ooh, come on, I've got a sticky mouse, orange. And I am also going to make these two thinner because I don't want to eliminate them entirely, but I don't want them to be the focus. All right, so I've got one point that will spin around the circle, and I've got one point that will slide back and forth on the radius. Okay, so that's a good, a good place to start. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to animate these points. And to help you see what's going on, I'm going to trace both this purple point and this orange point. So on display, I'm going to say trace points. And then I am going to animate them. I'm just going to stop there for a second. So what's happened is the purple point has animated the length of the radius at the same time that the orange point has moved along the circle. Both the points are going at the same speed, so this length here, it has this point here has traveled the same distance as the point on the radius, which means this arc here is uh, the length of a radius, or we could say that's a one radian arc of the circle. So I uh, just, just wanted to stop there because that's kind of a meaningful point for understanding what's going on. Now I'm going to unpause and continue my animation. And I'm going to try to press pause just as we've completed a single rotation of the circle. Pretty good. Okay, so now what we can see is we have three petals and a little more. And again, let's think about what that means. We've gone one full rotation, so one circumference of the circle. And then each of these petals, each petal half, is one animation along the radius. So each 
full petal is equivalent to two radii or one diameter. So what we've done is actually gone three diameters plus a little bit more, and that may seem to familiar to some of you. Three and a little bit more is, is kind of a special number in mathematics, right? Um, magic number of pi. Now, if I keep going, I will um, complete actually seven rotations of the circle. And when that happens, we're going to take a look at the petals. And I'm going to speed it up just a little bit. If I speed it up too much, my trace dots get sped up too much, and then there's too much separation. Um, the important thing for this animation is that both points are animating at the same speed. Okay, I'm going to speed it up just a little bit more. OK. And what we're going to see is, when is our flower complete? And I'm already telling you it's seven rotations, because otherwise I should have told you to count when I started this. <laughs> so you got to go around a little bit more. And so it turns out that once you've completed seven rotations, you almost meet up to where you started, and that is at 22 petals. So in seven circumferences of the circle, there are 22 petals or diameter lengths, and that 22 sevenths ratio um, some of you may be familiar with as an approximation for pi. So in our logo, we don't have the circle or the radius or the center point showing. We've, we've hidden all of those. And um, you just have the purple, uh, the purple flower, which we call the pi-petaled rose. Um, and Nick, Nick Takeef uh, first made this sketch. And it's a really beautiful visual representation of pi. So we were. Um, excited by the idea of using it as the logo. OK, so um, are there any questions that, uh, that I should address? Uh, the only question I see so far is whether we're going to make t-shirts with the logo, that, <clears throat> and that's a great idea. I'll, I I'll, love that idea. I'll bring it up. OK, that's a really, I love that idea. Um, so we. Um, we had unveiled our logo a couple weeks ago um, kind of locally. We put a new sign on our building, and um, a friend of mine saw it, and he just saw the finished logo, and he was asking me all these questions about it, and um, it, you know, just by email. And I was thinking, well, it's, I can't really explain it to you. I need to, what I need to do is show you the sketch. But um, I wasn't you know, able to see him in person, so what I did is I designed a presentation sketch, and I kind of wanted to be able to do all the things I did with, oops, I just cleared all my traces. I wanted to be able to do all the things I just showed you, where we stopped at one radian and stopped at one circumference, but I needed to automate it. So I made a presentation sketch for him. For the logo, I feel like building it from scratch is really powerful, but sometimes you know, you need something that you can send to a friend who isn't super familiar with Sketchpad, or you need something that you can use for a presentation and you don't have time to build from scratch. So I'm going to design now a little differently a presentation sketch that um, will have a lot more control and, you know, be able to show off features of the logo. So what I've done now is I actually just, um, I'm going to, construct my circle a little bit differently because I, when I'm de designing a presentation sketch, I don't always know what kind of computer I'm going to be showing it on or whether um, when I change the resolution of my computer for a projector, whether it's going to blow my sketch up way too big. So if I construct a circle using the radius outside the circle, then I can easily adjust it on the fly and um, and that's pretty convenient. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and make my my circle thin. Okay. Um, and now kind of another advantage of this is that uh, I can't accidentally use my per circle resize point as my radius point because then I get a really really crazy animation. 
So the first thing that, um, oops, I better, I'm going to do my, construct my animation point. So I'm going to make that one purple. This helps me keep track of what's going on when I color these this way. Okay, so the first thing I want to figure out how to do is I just want to show that one radian um, rotation to start. Now, I can make an animation button, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. If I select my two points, the, the purple and the orange, and I do Edit, Action Button, Animation, and it brings up these properties, and it says 0.5 bidirectionally, 0.4, and you can see the segment light up clockwise. And I see that one of my options here is to just go in one direction once. Okay, so that would just do one animation along the radius, so that seems pretty good. So I'm going to try doing that and see what happens. Cool. Oh, okay. So what happened was my purple point rotated once, or animated once on the radius, but my orange point kept going. So that's not exactly what I wanted to happen. So I'm going to use another kind of button called a presentation button that w gives me a lot more control over what I'm showing. I'm just going to erase this guy. I just deleted it. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to create two separate animation buttons. So this will give me kind of maximum flexibility. The first one I'm just going to do for the segment on the radius and I'm going to make it a single um, animation one direction on the radius and to remind myself what that is I'm going to call it uh, one radius. Okay, and I'm going to scoot this guy over here. Okay, so if I do that one, it just goes there. And because I said one direction, it pops back to the center after that. I'm going to make a second button for this, and I'm going to call it, well, first let me make it. I'm going to also do one rotation around the circle. So I'm going to call this uh, one rotation. Okay, now I'm going to select both of those animation buttons and I'm going to choose a different kind of action button called a presentation and that lets me do several movement buttons at once. In this case I'm going to present my action simultaneously. Um, if anything's selected or moving or tracing, I want to stop those. I have the option to do that or not. And for the one radian, I want it to stop as soon as that point is done moving on the radius. So I'm going to click the second option. Notice that the default is for it to stop after the last action stops, but I'm changing it to the first action. And I'm going to call that uh, one radian. Okay, now to make this prettier, I'm going to trace. And let's try it. Okay, so now I've just created a presentation button so that if I want to show someone what it looks like to just do a half petal, which is which is one radian arc, I have that. And if because I chose erase traces in the presentation button, if I do it again, I'll just see the single. I don't have to erase the traces. I, I chose to do that. Um, in the idea, keeping me with the idea of keeping this kind of polished, I'm going to do some color coding of my buttons. So those are going to be orange. This guy is going to be purple. If you notice the theme here, um, you're right. I'm I'm using our company colors here. So and notice when I press this, the two buttons, the two action buttons that it's calling on, both um, highlight there. All right. So I've created a button that shows off a one radian rotation. And now I want to make one that shows a full circumference. I have a button for rotating the outer point once, but now I need a button that will make all the petals that I need. So I'm going to highlight my um, purple point there and make another action button. And this one is just going to keep going and making petals. So I'm going to call it petals. 
And I'm going to move this guy down a little bit. I'm just pressing my down arrow. Um, Sketchpad 5 is pretty good about lining up objects for you, but I'll, I'll show you a trick in a second for, for how to line things up if they get all, um, get all off. Okay, so to make a one circumference, I'm going to need one rotation of the orange point, and I'm going to need multiple animations of the purple point. So I'm going to do another presentation button. And again, I'm going to do them simultaneously. The pedal button isn't ever going to stop, but the one rotation button will stop after one circle. So again, I need to select this option. And I think I'm going to go ahead and erase traces before I um, start that. And I'll call this uh, one circumference. OK, I'm going to make my petals button orange because it's kind of like a one phase button. And let's see what happens. If I did it correctly, it should do one exact full rotation, and we'll be able to see pi petals. Let's see. Ah, beautiful. OK, and I said I'd show you how to line up buttons, so I'll do that now before I forget. Let's say I have one button off in crazy land there. If I select two buttons, one after the other, and then I press Shift and Return on my keyboard, they hop right up under each other. And if I hold Shift and press my Enter key, I can move it down and, and add a little space there. So that's a trick that you can use to line up buttons and text and other objects in Sketchpad. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Um, one thing that can be really nice to have is a reset button, OK? I should mention before I go on that in my preferences right now, I have um, traces not fading, OK, because it makes it easier for me to work in the sketch. But I could click this. And then um, these traces on the screen would see would fade over time. So maybe I'll I'll leave it that way for now. Okay. So when I use this presentation sketch, I think I'm usually going to want to start from standard position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a uh, kind of a marker point on my sketch, and I'm going to color it black so I can tell it apart from my other sketch. And I'm going to label it. Um, start. Okay, and that's going to be kind of the home position for the orange point. Ooh, I still have traces on, but that's okay. Um, and so when I reset, I'm going to have this point move back to start, and I'm also going to want to have the purple point move back to the center. So I'm going to use a movement button to do that. To use a movement button, you select your point and where you want it to move to. And you can do this for as many pairs of points as you want. So I'm selecting the orange point and where I want it to move to. And now in action buttons, I'm going to use movement. And I'm going to call that one um, well, move points is OK. OK, I'm going to move that guy down a little bit. And then when I reset, I'm going to want to um, erase traces again. So I'm going to go, oh, and one thing that's good to know, because this point isn't really the most attractive one, is you can use a movement button on a point that is later hidden. So I can hide that point. OK. And now I'm going to create one more presentation button. And this one, again, I'm going to erase traces. And this time, because I only have chosen one action button, I don't have that other choice. And I'm going to call this one Reset. OK, so let's try that. Oh, well, I made a mistake. I'll show you what it is in a second. OK, the mistake I made, so what I'm doing is I'm going to control click on that button. You can right click on a PC or if you have a mouse with two buttons. I'm going to choose properties. And if I go to the move, I really wanted that to happen instantly because I'm quite impatient. So I'm going to change the speed to instant on my movement button. And now um, let's move these all over the place. Ooh, uh, I grabbed the wrong one. There we go. And let's do reset. OK, instant. And notice all my traces were cleaned up. OK, so 
I've now got a pretty robust presentation sketch. I can do one radian. I can do one circumference. And I can reset to start over. Um, final thing I'd probably want to do is a show hide button. So I can select, I think I'm going to do one more thing first. I'm going to do my, my full on animation button. And this is going to be both points, not stopping, not once only, medium speed. I could go a little faster so you guys don't have to wait too long, maybe 1.6. And for my label, I'll do full logo. And the last thing I'm going to do then is uh, create a hide show button because for the logo, uh, we don't actually want the center, the radius, the orange point or the green circle to show. So I'm going to do a hide show button actually, there. Actually, don't you want the orange button to show at the end and not the purple? Oh, no, I'm, not, I'm just doing the flower. Oh. So in other words, I don't want the orange tracing, though. Right. So, so I'm going to see how that looks. But Andres is right. I have left off the little orange tip at the end. Um, now, again, I have um, it fading traces, and the thing is, because it takes a while to create the whole petal, oh, interesting. Let's see. I wonder if I can do this mid-animation. We'll see. I'm a little bit confused about what's going on here. Andres, are you seeing this? I'm seeing that there's five petals instead of three. Yeah, what did I do? I don't know. Huh. Interesting. Did I make them different speeds, maybe? Could be. Hmm. It's always fun when something brand new happens in the middle of a webinar, huh? Oh, yeah, look at that. See how I said it was important to make them the same speed, and then I had to get all fancy. <laughs> so when you don't make them the same speed, you're kind of messing up the whole pie idea. But luckily, Sketchpad lets you change things. Well, you just opened up a whole other <coughs> arena for exploration. I did. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we don't need to watch the full 22, but just wanted to show you kind of two, two versions of the logo sketch, one that has a lot more detail in a presentation, but also just the way to, to build it from, from scratch on the fly. All righty, um, and you are going to get this sketch, so you'll have, you'll have everything to play with and, and mess around with on your own. Um, any questions before I go on? Oh, Craig, Craig totally spotted it. Good job, Craig. To yeah. Be oh, to call it, great introduction to radians. Yeah, I totally would have used this with my students um, in the classroom. We used the thing where you took a radian, uh, you took a piece of string and measured a radius and then wrapped it around the circle and saw how many times it could wrap. So I would follow that up with this sketch, I think. Okay, sorry, so, Andres, I interrupted you. No, there actually, there were a couple of questions that came up that you just then answered right afterwards, so there's nothing new that you haven't answered. There was questions about the speeds, but you've obviously addressed that, so. And then Craig said, any way to do this is a locus of points rather than a trace. That's a good question. Um, let's see. If I, I, I choose the purple, would it? No. No. <laughs> that didn't work. No, uh, a locus can only have a single driver. And, oh, you know, and, so we can't have two animations driving you have at them. two drivers. Uh-huh. Good question, and luckily, Andres has the answer. Okay, good. Um, any other questions? And Otherwise, we will, we will go on. 
Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, Craig, that sounds like um, he's asking if purple point move is a function of the yellow point. Right. So I would need more brain power than I have at 4.30 p.m. on an afternoon, but that's a, that's a good project. That's a good one to think about on my plane flight next week. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. Um, I do want to, I did want to ask um, everybody out there, yeah, no, I, I think it's a great question, Craig. So, um, is anybody who's in the audience going to be in Philadelphia next week for NCSM or NCTM? Because we're both going to be there, so I thought if, so give a shout out in the chat panel if you're going to be in Philadelphia next week. Andres and I will be there. We would love to meet you. Okay, cool. Awesome. So we'll be at the key booth. We're right up front. And um, yeah, so, so come, on, come on and meet us. All righty. So next one, again, building from scratch. And if we have any, I know we had a couple people who didn't have Sketchpad. I'm going to be kind of racing through this. But remember, we do post um, webinars. So uh, we post webinars. We post recordings of these webinars. So you can, um, if you didn't catch something, you can slow it down and, and watch the recording. And we do have beginning webinars the first Tuesday of every month. So please come back. Don't be discouraged if I'm, if I'm kind of going through really fast. So I'm going to be making a, um, first starting with the quadratic function, I'm going to be using sliders to, um, to vary coefficients. And I'm going to start by making the sliders because I'm going to do it in a really lazy way that some of you might want to use. Um, so I'm constructing a line. And in Sketchpad 5, uh, you can just construct a point on the line. And it will use these first two points as your 0 and 1 values. And then if I measure the value of that third point, I basically uh, get a slider from doing that like this. Okay, so that, that value will vary. And when I said I'm going to be lazy, what I'm going to do here is just copy what I just constructed, uh, copy and paste. And I've just created a second slider. And, and then I'm going to just uh, paste again and created a third slider. And the only reason I did it that way is A, because I'm, it's fast, and B, because then our, our, um, our zeros and our ones are kind of the same distance apart. I could have done it also by translation, but this is quicker. So, okay. Now I'm going to rename these guys. So I said I was going to be doing a quadratic function, and I'm going to name my slider points A, little a, and you can see they're being renamed up there too. Uh, H, because I'm going to be using vertex form, and K. And I'm going to relabel these measurements A, H, and K. And then uh, using my segment tool, I'm just going to connect the, this is the zero point to the slider point, And you can see that the lines now become dashed. Okay, I am going to hide these points that show where one is. I don't have to, but I'm going to. And I really don't need labels on these guys. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and hide these lines. Okay, so now I have three sliders, and they can be positive or negative. I have them set to hundredths right now, which is fine. I um, might want to move these values down. And again, as I said before, when you're, you're dealing with text on the screen, if I select all three in order there, and I hit Shift Return, they line up all nice and neat, and I can sort of space them out the way I want to. And I'm actually going to make those a little smaller. Okay, so I'm going to plot a function uh, using vertex form of a quadratic, so a times x minus, now I just click on them right on the screen. Again, I'm going through this pretty fast, hit the caret for the exponent. Um, 
Okay, and I've, I've got a quadratic now, and my equation went down there because that was kind of the last place I was working on text. So I'll make my equation bigger and blue, and I'll make my parabola thicker and blue. And now I can control the parameters with my slider, so cool. Okay, so this is a totally functional sketch. Nothing wrong with it, and you can see it took me just a couple minutes to create it on the fly, but this is about making your presentations more polished, so that's going to be what I do next. Now, what I'm going to do so that you kind of have all versions is I'm just going to make a copy of this page. So in document options, I'm just going to add a duplicate of quadratic 1, and I'm going to call it quadratic 2. And let's start making this a little prettier. So um, my thing is color coding. So if I'm going to have um, different parameters, I like to make them different colors. So I'm going to make my A blue, my point blue, and I think I'm going to make uh, that point larger so I can see that it's an important point. I might want to make that guy black so that I don't get confused and drag it around. Um, let's make H dark green. Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. Make the point dark green and large. And then same thing for K. I'm going to go with mm, purple. Okay, so, so that's all fine and dandy. Got some color coding going on. But this equation is kind of static for a dynamic sketch. So I'm going to use hot text. Now, in Sketchpad 4, you had to do this concatenation of text elements. But in Sketchpad 5, you can just, um, let's see, I'm going to make it not bold. You can just click on objects in the sketch to enter them into hot text. So A, there's my A value. Um, I'm just typing in right now X minus and type in my H. And I'm going to keep going with this. So if, if anything that I'm doing is bugging you, don't worry. I'm going to going to make it even better in a second. Um, I need an exponent there, so I don't know if this is visible. Oops. Where did it go? Using the text palette, I can do uh, exponent, type in my 2. I don't want it to be italic. Um, I have to say that some of the stuff I'm doing is I only do it because I was an editor, and that trains you in being really, really picky. Um, Okay, so now what I've done is I've pizzazzed up my sketch a little bit more, and I now have a dynamic equation to go with my dynamic graph. So that's an improvement. Of course, these can also be color-coded, right? So my A value is bright blue. I'm going to make that match. I'm going to make my H value match and not be italic. And I'm going to make my K value purple and not italic. Okay, so now this is starting to look pretty good. You can see the values change, but here is a feature of Sketchpad 5 that a lot of people don't know about, and I really like it, but it's a little hidden. Okay, so right now you can see that I'm going to move this. Let's see, I'm going to move this equation up, and I'm actually going to hide my grid so that you can all see this better. When I have a negative h value, uh, this is what happens. I have x minus negative 1.42. And same with my k value. OK, so that's all right. But if I want to be really fancy, I'm going back to my text tool. I'm going to delete my 
H value there, and I'm actually going to delete the subtraction. Now I'm pressing shift on my keyboard, and when I click on H, I get a choice. I can actually just add the label, I can add the value, which is what I had, or I can add the value as add end, and now it actually includes the sign with it. And now, so if I change my H value to negative, it just does it very prettily like that. Okay, and again, I did that by pressing, I got that option by pressing shift, so I'm going to repeat that for my K value. I'm pressing shift, and I get the choice, so value is add end, and uh, I think I have my text set for these automatic italic, which is why it's making everything italic. Okay, so that is looking really good. All right. Um, another thing I might want to do, especially if I were showing this, um, I don't know, I mean really pretty much any time I would want to do this. I like to make my axis numbers bigger. This is something that you couldn't really do in Sketchpad 4, but now you can just select the axes and you can change the size of the numbers. And if you want to, you can edit your preferences and actually set your axis tick number style to be large. So that's pretty nice if you're always projecting or working um, at a whiteboard. I think having the number the numbers larger, or if you're just like middle-aged like me, it's also nice. Okay, um, any questions so far? Because I'm going to go into uh, a one little over-the-top snazzy thing after this. Based on the, there's, I mean, just got from Carol, if your H is positive, shouldn't it be a subtraction? Oh, if your H, X minus H, you're totally right. So what shall I do? Shall I just put the subtraction there? Because it's x minus h, right? I think she's totally right. So it should be like that, right? Of course, then I don't think I want the value as an add-in. Now I have to, hmm, you've shaken my foundation to the core. Let's see. Now I have to think about that. Uh, what do you think? What is better? Would it be better to have it just like that? What do you well, all think? Steve had a good suggestion, yeah. which is to do a separate calculation of negative h. Oh, yeah. And then I paste think. that, and then paste that as an addend. And Robert suggested multiplying by negative 1, which is the same idea, I think. That would right. work. I, wonder I, there's think... a, I don't know if there's a more elegant way within Sketchpad. I'll play with it after you get back onto your next thing. Let's see. So we could do h minus negative 1, and then we could use, in our hot text, we could use that, right? So we'd, hmm, I have to think about that. Well, the h plus, it's very you, hard to think when yeah, you're presenting, no, no, you know? Elizabeth, you just need yeah. to get rid of the minus sign first, and then do the add end. Oh, right, right, right. You're, you're right. Um, so that's right. That's correct now. Okay. So this is actually a great segue into what I was going to talk about at some time during the presentation, which is um, sometimes making a sketch really pretty can actually sometimes make things a little bit confusing. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the trade-off. Uh, I think sometimes doing this kind of thing, okay, so now it's this whole object, and if I'm adding this other parameter in that's a calculation, is that more confusing or more clear? And I, I just leave that as an open question. I think sometimes um, all of us who tinker with Sketchpad a lot tinker to the point where it becomes sort of harder to understand the mathematics in the sketch, if that makes sense, when there's a lot of hidden stuff. So just something to think about, but um, thanks, thanks, Carol, and everybody else who, who caught that um, and, and made some really good suggestions. Yeah, Steve caught that too. John suggested you could hide the h times negative 1. I, that's what I would do at least. You know oh, I yeah. Mean? Yeah, I think so. I'll, um, I'm going to make a little button for it, though, since I'm going to be giving you guys this... Um, this sketch, and I'm going to call that, um, 
hide secret calculation so that you remember and I'll remember too okay so you know and you, you know you can always drag hide buttons off the screen but since this is a an educational sketch I'm going to leave it in there okay so that, that was good that was a good good quick thinking on your part audience <laughs> um, okay so I want to make one more snazzy thing um, hopefully I'm Hopefully this is mathematically okay, what I'm about to do. So this is something that is really nice about Sketchpad. You can go in now that we've built this, this basic um, sort of structure for a sketch, and I can just edit my function there. And instead of having a quadratic in vertex form, I now have a cubic, okay? And everything is drivable the same way. But you may have noticed that my hot text didn't change because that two was just, it's just a typed in two. So if I want to edit my, um, I would need to edit both the function and this hot text equation. But that got me thinking, maybe I could just create a parameter that would be the degree of the equation. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to make this a parameter and not a slider because I, I want a little bit more control. And I'm going to call it D. And I am going to edit this, so I'm doing control, click there, right shift, and it's, D is fine. I'm going to use uh, units for this. Actually, I'm going to start with two. It doesn't matter what I start with. I'm going to use units, and that's editing the value. And then for parameter, I'm going to have these change discreetly. I'm going to reduce this domain to something more manageable. And when I make keyboard adjustments, I want it to change by um, whole units, okay? So I haven't, I haven't used D yet, but I just want to make sure it acts like, okay. So what I'm doing is I'm pressing plus on the keyboard, I'm pressing minus. There's another way to change this that I'll show you in a second. I'm also going to make it red, because degree seems like it should be red. And I'm going to make it smaller. Okay, so now I'm going to edit both my function so instead of my exponent there, I'm going to click on D. And I'm going to edit the hot text. And so instead of my exponent there, I'm going to enter the degree. Um, and I don't want it to be italic. And I'm going to make it red so we can be all matchy. OK, now, so notice I did go back to a quadratic. So that's good. I'm going to try increasing it. I'm using the plus key. K okay, cubic, uh, quartic, I think. And again, for any degree, that vertex form is, is pretty good, right? And this is interesting for students to see, I think. You can also go down. Now, what happens when I get to 1? Ah, cool. OK, what happens when I get to 0? OK, constant function there. And ooh, this is cool. Even the negatives work, OK? And again, my sliders work. Now, if you have Sketchpad 5, make sure you get the latest update, because it has this new feature. And it's pretty cool on the iPad and on, um, oh, I just have a really hard time doing it with my mouse, so did you see that? It's called flickermenting, and if you grab on a parameter and just sort of lift your mouse up, it increases or decreases like that. Um, and it works really nicely on like a whiteboard or an iPad. So that's called flickermenting. Anybody that has Sketchpad 5, you can update to 5.04, and it has that feature. Sometimes I, it's sort of a particular flick that sometimes I can do and sometimes I can't do. OK, so that's enough fanciness with the transformations. Um, let's see what I've forgotten so far. Um, oh, yeah, I know. So the other thing I wanted to show was for folks with interactive whiteboards, I want to make sure that you're aware that if you go into preferences, um, there are some preferences that are really um, designed to help you improve performance on the interactive whiteboard. So if you're on an interactive whiteboard, you probably want to change your selection magnetism maybe to high. 
Um, if you have a tendency, if you're selecting multiple objects and you have a tendency to sort of click and white space and inadvertently deselect things, you might want to check the double click deselection. That means you have to deselect something by clicking on it again. Uh, you can also make the toolbox large. Let's see what that looks like. So huge toolbox, that makes it easier to grab. And now I set my selection magnetism to high, so you can see if I get not that close to point A, I can already grab it. Okay, so handy for use on an interactive whiteboard. Uh, another thing that can be useful I'm going to show the grid again. You can change the color of the grid. You can select it and choose display and you might want to select a darker color for the grid if it's not showing up well on a projector or on an interactive whiteboard. Um, another choice if you find yourself accidentally clicking on the grid or on any other objects, if you right click or you choose control click on any object and select properties you can make, you can uncheck this box so that it's not arrow selectable. And I do that sometimes when I have text on the screen that I accidentally hit. And it's also very nice to do that for the iPad because it's easy to select objects by accident on the iPad. So if there's stuff that you need on the screen that you don't want people to select, you can just right click and uncheck the arrow selectable box. And I'll give you one for sure example on the home page where I had the logo. Right now I have this as arrow selectable, but I don't really want that moving around on the screen. So I would um, oops, right, right click. Ooh, how come it's doing that? That's weird. Properties and unclick arrow selectable. And now I can't accidentally drag around my logo there. I can right click again and get it back. Okay. All right, good. So we have time for a couple fun things. So I'm going to create a new page and I'm going to call it fun thing one. Okay, I think this would be particularly cool on an interactive whiteboard. I'm going to bring up a coordinate system. Oh, and those points are huge. So I'm going to make them medium. And I'm going to use my marker tool, and I'm just going to draw a curve. And now I can select it, and using the number menu, I can define a function from drawing. Okay, And that's pretty cool, but what's really cool is I can go ahead, I'm going to plot new function, and I can transform my drawn function just the way you can transform any function. So of course I could have used a slider or a parameter to do this. And I think this is really neat if you've been working on um, function transformations with your students and then to show a completely random drawing function and show that it, it functions just the same way. So I'm going to do two times my drawing function and, and just see you know, see how these uh, transformations of functions work with any old kind of crazy function, even one that you wouldn't necessarily be able to write an equation for. So um, that is, yeah, you can make a test question with this too, huh? Okay, so that's, that is one fun thing, and I'm color coding this for your viewing pleasure. All right, and Another fun thing, sorry, I'm obsessive here. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Uh, another fun thing, I'm going to add a new page for fun thing two. Okay, so sometimes when you're doing a presentation, you just want something uh, jazzy and cool to show to your audience or to wake up your students or whatever. So, um, so I'm going to show one of those. So I'm going to plot a new function and this is a, a function that I um, tested out beforehand that I like. So it's going to be sine of x plus 
uh, cosine of 1.5 times x. And when I bring up a trig function, I get a prompt of whether I want to use radians. I'm going to say yes. So I have this nice wiggly function. The thing about Sketchpad is it, it always uses kind of the last color you picked. And sometimes I like that, and sometimes I don't. So that's my crazy function. And I am going to uh, construct a line, and I'm going to construct both points of the line on my function. And I am going to use that uh, animate button that we were using earlier. And I'm going to make them the same speed. We'll go uh, hmm, uh, maybe fast. I think we'll do them both fast. See how that looks. See how that looks. Uh, it's pretty fast. That's OK. All right. Now, that's OK, but it's not fantastic. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the slope. Now, when you have a measurement, you can use a parametric color based on the measurement. And you can't do that with everything. You can't do it with functions, but you can do it with lines, a constructed line. So what you do is you select, select the object, and you select a measurement. And under Display Color, you choose Parametric. And, um, and then you get a color range. I'm going to just use the Repeat Bidirectionally. OK, and I'm going to animate now. And now my line is going to change color as it moves on the crazy function. OK, so that's pretty neat. And now for the final piece de resistance, what I'm going to do, I'm going to trace it. Now I better check my settings because it gets a little hectic if you're uh, not, yeah, OK, I've got traces fading over time. Otherwise, it would be scary. And I'm going to. Hide my grid. And let's see how this looks for a. Now, this is going to probably look a little choppy on your screen because um, it's GoToMeeting, not Sketchpad. OK, I think I need my traces to fade a little faster than that. Oh, because I didn't have it checked. That's why. OK, so let's try it one more time. Yeah, my computer is uh, a little slower than it would be. Um, it's GoToMeeting, not Sketchpad. All right. So you can fiddle with different graphs, and you can hide all the evidence so that all you see is the, um, is the trace. And then you have kind of a flashy introduction to a presentation, which, you know, Again, it's just a nice way to, to catch your audience's eye or to wake your students up if it's an afternoon class. All righty, so um, I am going to show you one more thing in the last minute. And um, that is, I'm bringing up a website. This is sketchexchange.keypress.com. This is the home page. If you go to the community page, this is a forum that we have. Um, we have a forum called Sketchpad Explorer for the iPad. And this has tips for designing sketches to use on the iPad with Sketchpad Explorer. It has um, tips for limiting scrolling, how to store documents. Uh, so it's a really helpful forum. And if you go to Browse, and click iPad, I just kind of want to bring your attention to one super cool sketch. Um, Scott Steckety posted this sketch called Measure a Picture. And it's, it's kind of intended more for younger grades, 3 through 8. But it's, um, you can take pictures on your iPads and then use measuring devices in the sketch to, um, to measure objects and angles, both um, lengths and angles in the sketch. And it's really cool. And, um, for those of you who know Scott Steckett, he's an amazing um, sketchpad artist. So just wanted to point that out. For those of you who do have iPads, I recommend downloading Sketchpad Explorer and checking out the, the stuff on Sketch Exchange. OK, um, so that is, it's 5 o'clock. 
And I am done, but ready to answer any questions if you, if you have any. Yeah, um, the, I've been answering questions, and uh, I, the, the one somebody asked about making uh, text unselectable. Uh -huh. I should say to make text so, like it's, so you can't get rid of it. And I just explained that you can choose the properties. Maybe you could show that real quickly. And yeah. Can, you can, yeah. just so that, uh, and I forgot, I'm sorry, I've just answered so many questions in the last five minutes, I've forgotten who asked what. But whoever asked that question, you can't technically make it completely unremovable because the same trick to make it so that you can't just select it and delete it can be undone the same way that you do it. <laughs> so. So right. show, us, show us, Elizabeth. But, so I'm right-clicking, and then I get the properties, and if I just uncheck that, then it's not selectable. And if you do that for a sketch that you're viewing on the iPad, then that then it won't. It's not like you can undo it on the iPad. On the iPad, you can drag things and you can press buttons, but you can't do menu things and you can't right click on an iPad in any way, <laughs> you know. So that'll take care of it for an iPad, but if your students are savvy to right clicking and all that, they can they can figure it out. And I mean, and no harm done really if they find out how to make uh, text selectable. That, that means that they're playing around in Sketchpad, which is probably a good thing. So yeah, it was Craig that was asking something more permanent. Yeah, others on, on the desktop version, someone will still be able to right click and then make an arrow selectable again. But like right. Elizabeth said, uh, if you're making something for the iPad, there's no control like that on the iPad. So then that would be permanent. But um, there there is no other way. In fact, even the stuff that we've produced with our copyright information and so forth on our sketches is done with that implementation. So any savvy kid could eventually figure out that if you right click on it you can make an arrow selectable again. But right. that's that's the implementation we have. Uh, okay, well I'm seeing a lot of positive feedback and uh, there was also some questions about sketchpad development for a full sketchpad on the iPad. Uh, all we know is that that's in development. We don't have a timeline. I got at least one person asking if they're looking for people to beta test. Um, oh. And so I'm, I, I believe so, but I'm not sure. At this point, the uh, best thing to do is just email me directly, and I'll follow up on it if you're interested in becoming a beta tester at some point. And I'll, I'm putting my email in the chat panel right now. Yeah. Hope, and um, we, um, like I said, if I notice some of you are going to be in Philadelphia. We have our user group Thursday night, so absolutely make plans to come to that. And um, we're, Andres and I will be working at the booth for most of, um, well, NCSM and NCTM. I'm also, I'm doing a presentation on Thursday, um, so at 11 o'clock, so uh, send your friends if you have any middle school teachers going to Philadelphia. I'm doing a presentation on, on middle school math with technology using Sketchpad and Tinkerplot, so I'd love to see you or any of your friends there. Um, and thanks so much for coming and, and spending your evening or afternoon or early morning <laughs> from if you're from another continent with us. Um, and right. we'll be posting the, the sketch and the video uh, by the end of the week. Um, check out our new website and um, we'll, we'll see you at the next webinar hopefully. Okay, and uh, I, I, I have completely unsuccessfully typing my email into this chat panel. Uh, <laughs> I, got, I got it wrong the first time. And then I also want to say, I mean, both the current key press and key curriculum emails will be functioning. Um, but anyway, I just can't seem to type my entire email address without making an error along the way. Elizabeth, that was a great presentation. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. And uh, as Elizabeth said, by the end of the week, we should have the uh, archive of the recording as well as the presentation sketch available. When you go to our website, there's a, a new archive webinar section. And, uh, and again, if anybody is able to visit us next week in Philadelphia, we would love to see you. And thanks for joining us. And, and hopefully we'll see you again at a webinar at, a, at another Tuesday upcoming in the next few weeks. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Um, good night.